not long ago, I served as a guest artist in a large university school of dance and shared some of my work with a group of young people in a 90-minute technique class. This is something I have done countless times in all 50 states and in many other countries since 1967 when I first started touring and teaching master classes with RDT, the Repertory Dance Theater. As I scanned their eager faces and taut bodies, I sensed and felt that I was among an assemblage of dance majors who wanted to be right. They had been carefully selected through a strenuous audition process for potential success as professional dancers. They had competed to get there and knew that there was much competition ahead. The regular instructor was observing, as was the director of the School of Dance and other dance faculty, adding to their anxiety about looking good. I decided, therefore, to spend a large portion of the class guiding these young people into their bodies and away from external concerns. I believe that the experience of investigating new movement concepts and learning new dance phrases can truly be meaningful only when approached with the whole of oneself, the inner as well as the outer. I encountered in some of these students a fear of being who they really are, of honestly engaging in the process I was inviting them to experience. The fear that who they really are and how they really learn may not be good enough. As I reflected on that experience later in the day, while also beginning to compose this address, I thought back to my early Utah roots. While still pondering that fear of not being good enough, I flashed on a memory from my own life that had not been in my consciousness for many years. It was September 1946 in the Lehigh Elementary School, just 30 miles south of Salt Lake City. It was the afternoon section of Mrs. Rigby's first grade. The day's assignment was a coloring project, a mimeographed drawing of a covered wagon and two oxen standing on a flat horizon. She gathered the completed colorings and selected a few to hang on the wall, including that of little Billy Evans who had chosen to color the prairie sky not in solid blue, as did all the other kids, but in overlapping patches of most of the Crayola colors available, red, yellow, orange, green, pink, and purple, as well as a little blue. With her simple act, Mrs. Rigby delivered little Billy a double whammy. Not only did she cause me to realize to a degree I had not previously just how different I was from the other students, but she also created a situation in which I received a major dose of the derisive laughter targeted at kids who were different in the culture of Lehigh, Utah in the 1940s. Why did you choose Billy's? The sky is blue, everybody knows that. Despite the humiliation, I was also aware of a feeling of achievement. She had, after all, selected my coloring for special notice. She had also pointed out that the sky can be colors other than blue at sunrise, sunset, and that little Billy was using his imagination. That reflection helped me empathize with the fear of not being right that I had perceived in those master class students. It also made me wish that I could somehow reach out to all the children in our culture to help them to discover, as many of us do through the art of dance, what is unique and special about each individual's way of thinking and feeling. To let them know that being themselves and therefore unique or different is not only okay, it's great, a, a precious gift. I cherish the rediscovered memories of my first grade teacher. Perhaps because of her validation, I did not let the painful taunting heaped on me 
for responding differently forced me to behave in conformity with my peers. Instead, I continued to perceive, explore, and express in my own usually different ways. Even though it was many years before another teacher or role model with Mrs. Rigby's wisdom and inclusive spirit entered my life. I am delighted and humbled to speak to you today. In regard to our conference theme, the connections I would like to explore are those between teacher and student, connections among students, between each student and his, her sense of what is right for him or her, between our inner selves and our outer selves, and between dance or movement and our larger lives. The coloring incident foreshadowed and probably prepared me for the far more extreme derision and bullying I encountered when I began to study tap and ballet in third grade. I chose dance because I rejected the competitive sports I was being forced to experience. I just wasn't interested in baseball, football, and basketball, in which one was either a winner or a loser. And yet I loved moving. Lehigh was a farming village in the 1940s, and the only dancing people participated in was Oak Square and Ballroom. I discovered tap dance through the Hollywood movie musicals I saw almost weekly at the Utah Theater on Main Street and the Royal Theater on State Street. For five cents, I could immerse myself in the magical adventures of Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, Donald O'Connor, Ginger Rogers, Eleanor Powell, and Ann Miller. My parents were reluctant to encourage my plan to become a dancer, wanting to save me from name calling and isolation and hoping it was a phase I would eventually pass through. When they refused to buy me tap shoes, I discovered that I could make sounds on the floor by holding my older brother's marbles under my bare toes. Such determined behavior finally convinced my parents to allow me to take dancing lessons. My father found a retired Vaudevillian hoofer who taught once a week, hour-long combination tap and ballet classes in his basement in Salt Lake City. Charles Purrington was about to begin a new class in which there would be other boys, a prerequisite established by my father. Mr. Purrington was 72 years old and legally blind, but he introduced me to an enchanted world of flaps, shuffles, buffalo steps, time steps, pas de bourre, changement, and balance. I was in heaven. I practiced these steps wherever I went, on the street, going to and coming from school, waiting in lines for shopping, uh, uh, sh uh, running shopping errands, in my parents' cafe, and in my grandfather's pool hall, where I would perform a tap improvisation for anyone who dropped a nickel in the jukebox and gave another to me. My parents purchased a portable record player and several 78 RPM records of such tunes as Cruising Down the River Sunday afternoon at I Love You, a bushel and a peck. We had a three foot by six foot strip of linoleum under an archway between the living room and dining room rugs, which became my studio and stage, where I would spend hours a day making up dances and teaching them to my younger sister whenever she was willing. My spirits soared at these times. I was transformed by this participation in rhythmic sound and movement from a lost little boy who didn't fit in to a young artist able to connect to the universe, to the age-old rhythms recorded on those 78 discs, and through the audiences in my imagination, sitting in movie houses and admiring my performances, I was discovering my way of being fully alive. Throughout those early years, I was fortunate that my teachers, first Charles Purrington and then his daughter, June Purrington Park, who had been trained in Hollywood by the remarkable tap artist Louis Dupron and the ballet dancer Ernest Belcher, Marge Champion's father, emphasized the learning and performing of dances rather than focusing entirely on proper rules, lines, and positions. The rhythms we made and how we communicated to an audience 
were more important than how we looked. We didn't really study technique so much as just plain dancing in various styles, such as tap, ballet, character dance, and even flamenco. Charles and June encouraged my passionate involvement in both classes and performances, and my self-esteem, which because I had rejected sports in a sports-oriented family and community, had been extremely low for most of my young life, was enhanced by the positive responses I received from teachers and some classmates. I was experiencing the essence of dance, I believe, as it has been practiced in all cultures and all times. This is not high art, but it gave added meaning to my life and connected me to other dance students and to the music and dance icons of our popular culture. I rearranged and choreographed dances and performed them at church socials, weddings, and various gatherings of civic organizations throughout our valley. I began to find my way of experiencing and reflecting my world and my place in it, of expressing my wonderment for the miracle of life. I had barely begun to learn these steps myself when I started organizing classes after school in the bedroom I shared with my sister and brother, where I would teach a few willing classmates from the Lehigh Elementary School the steps I had learned in Salt Lake City, as well as some I was inventing myself. By age 13, I was teaching several dance classes a week at American Fork, where a high school friend of my mother's had opened a studio and invited me to teach the more advanced students. At age 14, I choreographed my first major production, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, for performances in the American Fork High School Auditorium with live music and sets and props I made myself. At 17, I opened the Bill Evans School of Dance with more than 200 students, which allowed me to put myself through the rest of high school and five years at the University of Utah, where I pursued two majors, English and ballet, three minors, French comparative literature and history, and a commission through ROTC as a second lieutenant in the US Army. At age 15, I had enrolled in the academy of a famous ballet master and choreographer who had recently moved to Salt Lake City. This remarkable man was particularly successful at training male dancers who went on to successful careers in the dance world. And I found myself in a group of young men from throughout the Western United States who had come to Utah to study with this celebrated teacher. I met boys of my approximate age from cities and towns in Montana, Hawaii, Alaska, and Washington State, who had also grown up as the only boy they knew who wanted to be a dancer. It was reassuring to be with others like me. It was also, in some ways, disheartening. I was often told that my body was mostly wrong. I did not close my fifth position all the way. I did not wrap my foot around my ankle and stood the coup de pied, or bevel it in arabesque, in which my knees always looked inappropriately bent. In short, even though I knew every step in the book, had excellent rhythm, was a quick study, and communicated successfully with audience, is I was told that my feet and knees specifically and other body parts generally didn't look right. Therefore, I felt wrong. I later realized that it was probably my effeminacy that irritated my homophobic teacher and caused him, perhaps unconsciously, to find reasons to invalidate my dancing. I was entranced by my teacher's remarkable charisma, charm, energy, passion, and physical strength. But it was his comments about my feet and ankles which most concerned me. My feet and knees, I mean which must concern me. I became obsessed with forcing them to create the right positions and lines. I wanted desperately to please my new teacher, who tried to accelerate my improvement and, as I came to understand later, express his unarticulated rage about my latent homosexuality. 
by verbally humiliating me in front of the other students and occasionally by hurling his long black cane across the studio toward my sickled feet. I determined that my knees would become straight and my fifth positions completely close, no matter how long it took. Even though I eventually succeeded in these quantitative pursuits, the quality of my dancing, my self-esteem, and my spiritual life went through a gradual deterioration. Many of my fellow dance students were able to thrive in this atmosphere, but it didn't work for me. I discovered that my world of dance had become as competitive as the world of sports I had rejected, that there were winners and losers here too, and that when I looked wrong, I felt like a loser. Despite the fact that I had found my early love affair with dance replaced by a struggle to please a man who could not accept me for who I was, I persevered. For many years, as I left Utah, finished my active duty in the Army, and became a professional dancer, I believed that those in authority, because they had become professionally successful, must know what was right for me. Since I was unable to make perfect pictures with my body, it seemed somehow fitting that I should be verbally abused and should have to struggle against my body's perceived deficiencies and endure physical pain. In 1969, however, after almost 15 years of training in major ballet, modern, and jazz styles of technique in Utah, Louisville, Chicago, New York City, which I continued to approach with full emotional and physical passion, determined to gain control of the skills that would help me express my choreographic messages to the world. I found my 29-year-old body chronically injured. I suffered unrelenting pain in my lumbar spine. I experienced immobility in my cervical spine as a result of a large mound of protective tissue that had developed to shield my neck from ballistic stretching exercises that required rolling through a position in which the entire weight of my body was placed on the cervical vertebrae, and chronic near pain, knee pain, which had been diagnosed and treated for years by several medical professionals as tendonitis. It was, in fact, I later discovered, chondromalacia, softening of the patellar cartilage, resulting from lateral medial muscle imbalance in my quadriceps and from inappropriate outward rotation of my knee, the tibia, at the knee joint. At that point, fearing that my dancing years might already be behind me, I resolved not to take more technique classes until I figured out for myself what my body needed. For the first time since I had entered the world of dance instruction through intimidation, a phrase that characterized much of the serious dance teaching practiced at that time, I decided to take control of my own dance training. I had been once in touch with my bodily wisdom, I realized, reason that allowed me to learn quickly, dance expressively, and find deep satisfaction in moving. I had gradually become consumed by my body's limitations, as pointed out for me by numerous skilled, successful, well-meaning, but, but tradition-bound technique teachers, and had tried to overcome those perceived deficiencies from the outside in through force and hard work. I wanted to start over, to figure out from the inside what movement patterns would be safe, helpful, and regenerative to repattern into my neuromuscular system. Fortunately, I had been given a hiatus from the Repertory Dance Theater, a Salt Lake City-based company, with which I was a full-time member for seven years to travel to West Berlin to create a new work for the German Opera Ballet. While there, I spent several hours each day alone in a huge, empty opera house studio, exploring simple gestures, postures, and weight shifting, trying to figure out what instinctive gifts had enabled me to be such a successful tap dancer as a child, and how I could apply that information to my activities as a professional adult modern dancer. I began to accept the fact that I had learned to hate myself for what I was not. 
that I started a long process of accepting and embracing the realities of both my sexuality and my physical structure, of respecting my body's messages to my mind. I discovered that my body and my heart would tell my mind what I needed if I would just pay attention to them. I came to recognize an internalized homophobia, a self-hatred resulting not only from verbal slurs, but also from unspoken but clear body language messages from family, peers, and others throughout my childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood. I became aware of patterns of breath holding and permanent contractions in certain large superficial muscle groups. I began to experiment with various mental images that could guide me to sensations of greater ease, fuller flow, more joint freedom, and eventual changes in muscle composition toward more symmetrical balance and healthier tone. I was encouraged by early breakthroughs in this process of looking inside and acknowledging and validating what I discovered there. And the world inside, the integrated world of sensation, feeling, mind, and spirit, gradually became available to me. I became aware that my early tap dancing had included liberal use of what the Mar Laba Martenia system calls shape flow support. Breath-related changes in the size and the shape of the abdominal thoracic cavities in support of gestural and postural activities. I began to incorporate the relaxed and natural qualities of the tap dancer into my modern dance classroom and choreographic movement patterns. In 1969, that was a radical addition to the modern dance vocabulary, which had been developed by an earnest generation of pioneering artists struggling to have movement taken seriously as profound communication, not mere entertainment. I discovered that my tap technique had encouraged a releasing of the superficial muscles surrounding the hip joint, a balanced use of the whole leg and foot by establishing what I eventually learned was a harmonious rhythm between the psoas and hamstrings as major initiators of flexion and extension. I sensed a need to go beyond passe to full hip flexion of the gesturing leg and as I patterned the Evans passe, as my students were calling this action, into my classes and choreography, I found a deeper strength and control for hip flexion and a greater range of motion in développé. I discovered that by replacing an over-reliance on the quadriceps and gluteals that I had developed as a ballet and modern dancer with a fuller use of the smaller, deeper muscles closer to the bone, I could find within a modern dance vocabulary the joint mobility and qualities of lightness and free flow that had characterized my early tap dancing. I was learning with excitement and depth because I was finally admitting that my personal needs, feelings, and sensations were relevant. I began to realize that I was, and always had been, a good, loving, and generous person. And I found a life partner who affirmed those qualities in me and helped me to come out to family, friends, and the world and fully come out to myself. When they had first arrived on campus, most of the dance majors I have had the opportunity to teach in my 30 years as a professor including 16 at the University of New Mexico and 10 at the college at Brockport, State University of New York. Most of those students have learned to value inordinately the appearance of conformity. They mostly want to be right, and they mostly fear looking wrong. For that reason, I have developed courses required of all dance majors, minors, and transfer students that are designed to facilitate a process of self-discovery and acknowledgement of personal uniqueness. 
my own process of self-discovery and self-acceptance was facilitated by my study of Laban Barteliev movement studies, which began almost 40 years ago when Peggy Hapney joined my dance company and my Seattle-based school. Continued under Janet Hamburg, who taught at my summer institutes throughout the 90s and, sorry, 80s and 90s, and was more recently enhanced under Peggy Hackney again with Janice Meaden, Ed Groff, and Pam Schick in the Integrated Movement Studies program at the University of Utah. Linda K. Hartley articulates my experience in her book, The Wisdom of the Body Moving, when she says, my instinct told me that I was all up in the air. I needed to get my feet firmly on the ground and relocate myself clearly in my body. I began to dance as a means to both embody and express who I am. I found I was also on the path of knowing in a new way that which I am. As I explored ways of making deeper contact with my body, my body was teaching me a new awareness of myself. Since I want our students to make similar deep contact with and learn from themselves, the technique course I teach is organized around the evolutionary developmental movement patterns as organized by Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen in her system, Body Mind Centering. Throughout a semester, we investigate and experience these patterns as they begin with cellular respiration at conception proceed to early childhood through the overlapping stages of navel radiation, spinal, homologous, homolateral, and contralateral patterns of total body connectivity, coordination, and integration. In a follow-up course in Laban Barteniev Movement Studies, we explore and experience these same neuromuscular connections as they serve us in our adult lives as patterns of total body organization. Breath, both lung and cellular, core distal, head tail, upper lower, body half and cross lateral. Discovering that images derived from these patterns can travel at the speed of light to organize and integrate the entire body mind in an instant to function efficiently. We approach our understanding of these fundamental organization patterns with the whole of ourselves engaging the four functions of the psyche, thinking, sensing, feeling, and intuiting, as they relate to the Laban motion factors of space, weight, flow, and time, to perceive which patterns are fully accessible to us, as well as which patterns could be more available. We identify individual variations and relationships to each pattern and ask, is this way of organizing my body, mind, serving my needs, or could I replace it with one which might more appropriately do so? We study the process of change itself, learning to understand that growth requires change, and that change is an ongoing, long-term process. As Peggy writes, movement is a metaphor for change. It is also an actualization of change. You are changing the habitual way you use your body and relate within yourself and to your world as you practice moving in new ways. Your neuromuscular system is getting new information. By being actively involved in your own movement patterns, you can participate thoroughly and be in charge of your own change. We discover individual meanings within the context of uniquely personal movement behavior and learn to recognize that one can move with full psychophysical involvement. One can be fully alive in the moment only when personal meanings are recognized, investigated, and expressed. We recognize that there are always many possibilities and that no one way of engaging with the world is necessarily superior to others. Last spring, there were 32 students in the course I've been describing. During the final two weeks of the semester, as each student presented the results of her or his personal journey of exploration, discovery, reflection, and personal meaning making, 
I repeatedly experienced goosebumps and was moved to tears. I witnessed 32 stories of transformation, some subtle, some involving quantum leaps of understanding and change. Students described how and when the patterns of total body organization, integration, coordination, and connectivity serve them as dancers and in their larger lives, confirming that their dance lives and their larger lives are seamlessly connected. They shared plans for future person growth and strategies for facilitating positive change, for replacing those habits and behaviors they no longer need with patterns that will allow them to move forward in their lives more efficiently toward personal and professional goals. Many of them described how the fear of being different or not good enough had caused them to hide, using movement to conceal rather than reveal who they really are. By being able to recognize and wrap words around their individual differences, they were able to claim ownership of those patterns and traits that make them unique. Invariably, these recognitions of uniqueness were met with expressions of enthusiastic support from classmates. It was thrilling to witness students discovering and claiming ownership of aspects of themselves that had been hidden inside for years. I was not the only person crying as students shared fears, doubts, perceptions of themselves that they had discovered inside and were now able to share as they said, this is who I am and that's okay. They did most of the work themselves. My job was primarily to guide them into terrain that many of them had long ignored, and then to get out of the way as they engaged in the process of constructing self-knowledge. During the semester, we often discussed the difficulties one encounters in the process of going inside. Invariably, students realized how short a time one semester really is, and that the process of change they have embarked upon has just begun. I often quoted Linda McCray Campbell, who said, scientific research in neurology, psychology, and education has etched expanded images of what it means to be human. There is an unlimited capacity for lifelong learning. And adults, as well as children, learn what has personal relevancy. In all my courses, I try to facilitate the creation of safe environments where students can find the freedom to claim personal voice and discover how much each of them and each of their peers contribute, can contribute to the process of generating knowledge for the whole community of learners. I believe that it is truly a gift to be perceived in a non-judgmental way. And I integrate opportunities throughout each movement class for students to work in pairs, one moving and one witnessing at a time, and then both sharing with each other what they noticed. We all have much to learn from the perceptions of our peers, and I find myself increasingly relying on peer teaching as I work toward my lifetime goal of becoming a more effective teacher. As Martin V. Covington says, students learn that the rewards of contributing to the well-being of others surpass the dubious benefits of triumphing over them. I assign or ask students to select study buddies in all my courses and ask them to work collaboratively with one or two peers, both in and out of class, to support and encourage meaningful change and growth throughout the semester. Early in each course, I tried to model a kind of sensitive, honest, non-judgmental feedback that I would like them to exchange. Describing work habits and processes I admire and or what could be more efficient and productive about the student's way of working, rather than commenting on his or her character traits or abilities. In some of my courses, the final assessment project involves each student presenting an extensive report 
utilizing visual aids and or videotape and physical demonstration on the process and progress that his her study has ex study buddy has experienced throughout the semester and suggesting goals she might pursue in the future. A student being discussed participates in the creation of the presentation and often demonstrates the movement issues being, being examined. I encourage all teachers to develop their own peer teaching strategies because we cannot do all that needs to be done by ourselves and because our students have so much to learn from one another and we have so much to learn from them. At the university I was telling you about, I observed one of the faculty members conduct an advanced modern technique class. She came to university teaching after a brilliant career as a performing artist and still dances with enormous skill and expressivity. And yet she was tentative and hesitant knowing that I was watching her. Earlier she had watched me teach and had commented on my use of language drawn from anatomy kinesiology and La Bonbartinian movement studies. I perceived that she lacked confidence teaching in front of me because she had not yet learned those words. Her students, however, revealed articulately the excellent results of her teaching as they fully embodied a dance style that is often executed only superficially by, some, by such young practitioners. I felt bad that she was feeling linguistically inadequate rather than realizing that the bodily kinesthetic and intrapersonal intelligences she embodies vibrantly were serving her students very well indeed. This occurrence led me to reflect back a few years to a reception given in my honor by a Texas ballet company when I was serving as an adjudicator for Regional Dance America. A woman who had recently received her doctorate in dance from Texas Women's University said to me, you were the best teacher I ever had. She was talking about the two years in the early 70s during which I was an assistant professor at the University of Utah and she was earning her MFA in dance. I said to her, how could I possibly have been the best teacher you ever had? I knew so little. You see, that was before I had studied dance science or somatic, so my teaching relied primarily on observation and intuition. I thought about her comments for several days and began to realize that perhaps my intuitive teaching was just what she needed at that point in her journey of learning. I discovered that I had created an internal hierarchy of the different stages of my own development. I had placed the more recent more scientifically and somatically educated self above the earlier, more passionate and intuitive person I once was. Howard Gardner says in Intelligence Reframed, I don't find it odd to speak of the bodily skill used by a dancer as embodying intelligence. The performances of these individuals are valued in many societies and they involve an enormous amount of computation, practice, and expertise. Snobbishness about the use of the body reflects the Cartesian split between mind and body and a concomitant degradation of processes that seem non-mental or less mental than others. However, contemporary neuroscience has sought to bridge this gap and to document the cognition involved in action and for that matter, in emotion. The hesitant teacher I described in the University School of Dance is doing to herself what I had done to myself in Texas a few years ago. How many of us in the profession of dance teaching might be doing the same thing? How many of us place more value on the skills that allow us to talk effectively about dance than on our earlier developed skills of expressing ourselves articulately through actual dancing? It is wonderful, I think, to be able to capture and organize verbal symbols for moving and dancing in a way that allow the linguistic and logical mathematical intelligences of our students to serve them more fully. 
I believe, however, that the creation of inner polarities, hierarchies among the various people each of us has been and can be, is a useless pursuit. I learned enormously from the dancing of that insecure teacher. And I have learned from almost every student I have ever taught, whether he or she painted the sky multicolored or perfectly blue. There are always many ways of proceeding, engaging, processing, and being. I believe that we know different things in different ways at different times. It is the depth of that knowing and the generosity of the spirit, I feel, that distinguish the excellent teacher or dancer from the adequate one, and not the particular intelligence or verbal or movement vocabulary through which that knowing is expressed. I humbly acknowledge the wisdom, accomplishments, and love for dance and for learning possessed by those of you who are here today. Most of you can probably recall your own Mrs. Rigby, a teacher or role model who helped you accept and find satisfaction in your own uniqueness. I have encountered the negative impact that can result from the fear of being different countless times throughout my life's journey, but with the help of generous teachers, mentors, friends, and colleagues, I have discovered that by going inside, I can connect to timeless and universal bodily knowledge. The body's wisdom allows me to find a wholeness a totality of presence, a vibrancy on the cellular level that allows me to bridge polarities, to integrate my inner and outer worlds, and to move forward in my life. I make the call to all of us, especially myself. Let us continue to recognize, acknowledge, validate, and celebrate personal patterns of thinking, feeling, knowing, and being in ourselves, our colleagues, and especially our students. Let us honor our visionary, pioneering mentors by carrying their passionate spirits with us as we integrate and synthesize scientific information and adapt to the accelerating development of new technological tools. Let us regenerate our commitment to the construction of greater dance awareness and new instructional programs in our respective corners of the world. Let us become increasingly more open to the possibilities of positive change and the marvelous diversity of uniquely personal patterns in which those changes can manifest themselves. And may we connect to our inner selves, our former selves, our future selves, to our students, our teachers, and our peers, as fully and as often as possible. Thank you. take a moment to just offer to all of you an opportunity first for William to have a little drink of water after that but to ask any questions that you might have if there's any questions that you might have that you'd like to pose to William this would be a great time to do that and I would love to hear any questions Okay, uh, it's a struggle to experience my body growing older. It's a struggle to feel inside just the way I did 
that day and find out that I don't go in the air anymore, that I don't go up anymore, but I still feel as though I could. I still feel the essence of it, even though I'm not going there. So it's a struggle. It's a, my mother uh, was, was my best friend. She lived on 97. I talked to her every single day for the last 20 years of her life. And she would tell me all the time, growing old is not for sissies. <laughs> but there's something, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that I'm healthy. I appreciate the fact that I have so many cherished memories and that I can still move. But I still, I still long for those days when I could do all those things that you can all do. Okay. So. <laughs> you still feel, what do you find in your outlet? Well, I tend to dance. I tend to dance. Because I can find in rhythm and in small movement and in expressivity and in qualitative investigation, I can find a lot that I can still work on. I'm still, I'm still trying to become a better dancer. But uh, the, kind of the athletic part of it is what I, I loved. And I just thought, enjoy every day. Enjoy every day. And take good care of yourself so that you don't so sideline yourself with injury. Of course. Enjoy these wonderful, healthy bodies. I was teaching technique in Blackboard on Thursday. And, and my, these students were kind of wanting to go on automatic. And I said, we need to be dancing about something. So what are we dancing about? So we were doing Tandu, Pierre Grand, an old Le Mans, uh, Grand Batman pattern. I said, what is this about? So we decided it was about a celebration of their young, healthy bodies. <laughs> so I think we need to, to dance, to be, to invest meaning and intent before anything we do, and, and really to not take it for granted. Yeah, it seems like yesterday that I was your age, and here I am, 74, and uh, so don't take it for granted, enjoy it, and share it, and the more ways in which you experience your young, healthy body, the more parts of yourself that you use to uh, experience them, uh, the richer your lives will be. So anyway, I'm going on another question. <laughs> What was it like working in Germany? Well, back then, this was when there was the, the wall, when there was uh, East Germany and West Germany and East Berlin and West Berlin. It was a, an incredible experience. This is 1969. And everywhere I went, I felt uh, as though World War II was still happening, even though it had been decades since then, uh, the tension in the air. And uh, as a, I was only 29, but as a choreographer, I was treated uh, by the Germans as a very important person. They, uh, I don't know if it's still that way, but at that time, choreographers were like, you know, doctors and scientists. We were important people. And so I was escorted across uh, through Checkpoint Charlie and went into East Berlin almost every day to see uh, museums and memorials. And so I spent a lot of time seeing the, the enormous contrast at that time between uh, east and west Berlin, it was enormous. And, uh, uh, the German people were uh, direct, quick and strong and direct, and I, uh, at that time particularly, uh, was not that way. So it was difficult for me. Um, the director of the German Opera Ballet said, oh, we've got this young American coming, I'm going to give you all 12 principal dancers of the Deutsche Oper Ballet. Well, I had this uh, Ela Eltokimaba, you know her? Yeah. Exquisite dancer. Well, I went in, I said, all right, take your shoes off. <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, we're going to kneel. <laughs> what? <laughs> so she went to Gert Reinhold, the director, and said, I'm not taking my shoes off. I'm not kneeling. So she, you know, she's an exquisitely wonderful artist. I saw her do Giselle and broke my heart, it was so beautiful. However, I ended up not working with 12 principal dancers. I ended up finding out who in the company wanted to take their shoes off and <laughs> kneel and roll. And so, uh, and it, it included a couple of the principals, but some of the, the, 
that's just in the core, we've never had an opportunity to suddenly got that chance because they were willing. Of course, the world has changed a lot since then. Nowadays, there's not such a vast separation between what happens in ballet and what happens in modern or contemporary dance. But, but anyway, it was great. Thank you very much. Why? Do you, have you been in Germany? Want to come to Germany? No, not really. I just wanted to know why you decided to do this question. Uh -huh. Well, the technology blew my mind. I was using a, a recorded score by Morton Sabotnik. Anybody ever know his music? Wonderful electronic composer. And uh, in the beginning, the, the, the work of his is called The Wild Bull. In the beginning, the music is roar, it's like a bull roaring. And uh, so I said to the technicians, uh, I'd like it to feel that it starts over there and then travels around. And they said, no problem. Now, I'd never been in a theater. There were thousands, or I don't know, hundreds of speakers in this theater. And through this little uh, device, they could start the sound there and it would travel all the way around the theater. And you're sitting, uh, it was just remarkable, the, the uh, level of their technology at the time. And the amount of money that the Germans were willing to spend on art was just mind boggling to me because I'd been struggling over here and going over there and seeing how important performing art was to them, and how children went to the opera. It was wonderful in, in many ways. So thank you for asking. I have lots of great memories of that time. Yes? Is that your favorite type of game, or do you have one? Every type is my favorite. <laughs> Every type. I, I'm still good at taps, so. <laughs> so I guess that makes it by default. <laughs> the current my favorite. Oh, absolutely. I could not, I cannot imagine how empty my life would be if I hadn't experienced tap dance. Uh, tap is just a wonderful tradition. Rhythms are centuries old. They're passed on by person to person in Africa, person to person in the British Isles and Ireland. And then I have been given the wonderful gift. I'm a repository of all those generations of one arm and person to person and passing on these rhythms and they're so rich and delicious. And they live within me. I've, they've been within me since I was that little boy. So yeah, tap has been so important to me. Um, but I, one of my colleagues at the university, every year that we have a new group and she says, have you decided yet who your favorites are? And I said, they're all my favorites. What do you mean? And Every dance style I've ever studied is my favorite. I'm not good at some of them, but, but I, um, I just look at all of them as guests. So. But yeah, I, if you have an opportunity to study tap dancing, take it. That's my advice. Who, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Actually, I do less and less as the years go by uh, because they do it now. Uh, I started teaching the freshmen, I don't know, 25 years ago. I was, uh, I was the head of the dance program at the University of New Mexico. And we had a problem with uh, attrition. People would come and then before they finished the freshman year, they some of them may leave. So I thought, well, we had the practice of giving the freshman class or the beginning technique to the least experienced teacher. So I thought, maybe as the oldest and most experienced teacher, I should go teach the freshman and see what happens. So I started that. And uh, so it has been my goal ever since then to learn who they are, learn who their favorite teacher is, they write me letters. Who is your favorite teacher and why? And um, why did you come here? Uh, so in that first semester, they write me about five to seven letters. And, and then I, I respond to them. And we have a performance. At the end of the first semester, all the new dancers perform. And the graduate student 
the first year graduate students for the most part, choreograph that performance so that all the new students from the first week are involved in the creation of new work. And they get to know each other. And the rule is, every student gets to uh, show us, share with us, what she is best at, whether it's tap or African or hip hop or whatever it is. So we find some, like, some graduate student agrees to let that student or that group of students who are hip hop dancers to have that chance. Now, Brockport is a modern focus program. It's a postmodern focus program. And they may never again do another tap dance or hip hop dance, but that first semester, we try to acknowledge and validate what they're doing. Because I think it's very important. What happens a lot, people come to these modern dance focus programs and they come in and everything's wrong. Everything they've been doing since they were three years old suddenly is wrong. So I try to say, boy, I really love what it is you bring. I try to look at each person. Everybody has something pretty extraordinary about them. If you stop looking at a person for what she is not, and start looking at her for what she is, well, everybody has so much that is uh, so worth getting to know. So validation, sense of community. We do, as I did in the technical class this morning, they, they talked about it. They showed us about it. So, welcoming them, validating what they're doing, and making them know that we care about them. And there's, there's a community here where they are important. Nobody leaves Brockport. We have the opposite. We have a retention. Uh, too much retention. <laughs> Nobody ever goes. So. But as a result, as I said, I hardly do anything anymore because it's now in the culture. The students learn from each other and teach each other. And it's, I hardly have to do anything anymore because that's the way we are there. So, um, anyway, I, I've written a little bit about this, a couple of articles. I, I can write some more about it. And, <coughs> but I think it's a good question, a good question. One more? Yeah. No, No, I, I think I teach very conventional technique. I think that, can you, did you hear the question? Uh, how did it, uh, let me say this. I was just part, this is my generation. I'm not the only person who had this kind of journey. There were thousands of us who were realizing that kind of, a lot of the myths had been passed on about the body. Like suck this and tuck this and pull this. You can't really do it, you can't immobilize yourself and then dance. <laughs> But yet, we've been told to do it. We all tried to do it, but every, you know, we were all chronically injured. I wasn't, I wasn't so exceptional. It was who we, that was a generational thing. So lots of people were undergoing the same kind of process I was. But um, at Brockport now, I think I, I'd say that my technique draws from Limon and Graham and Cunningham and Nikolai. Those, those were all people I studied with. And uh, I, I, have, I was enriched by my work with them. So when people leave my uh, class, I think they have a conventional dance technique. It's not just a post workout technique, it's not just releasing contact. They can stand on their leg and they can do all those things that I love to do, used to love to do. Um, but I teach it through a law bound bartender point of view, so I don't use the language. But, but yeah, it's. Uh, Laban said, human movement is shrinking and growing. You know, on the most basic level, we're getting, we become smaller than we become larger. That's pretty much all we do. And Graham called it contraction and release, and, and Doris Humphrey called it fall and recovery, but we we're, all, we're all dealing with the same basic idea. So the Laban language is, um, is open-ended. It doesn't tell you a particular way to move. It lets you find your own way through these things. But my students know that when they come to me, they don't get a conventional advanced background. And when they go to others, I got somebody, we got somebody on, on faculty right now who's just, 
goes to New York every weekend. It's, he's get, they're getting the latest downtown dance for a bit, and they got something else to put somewhere. So I think we need we need to have many different experiences. Does that help at all? Okay. Well, anyway, thank you, everybody. Thank you. For Thank you, William, for sharing such inspirational stories. I hope the rest of the afternoon goes great for everybody, and we will see you all back here this evening, I think, for a performance.